everybody. Um, welcome to the lecture today. We're going to talk about the governance of global sport. I know in your chapter on Sage, uh, from Sage, he covered a lot about um, the Olympic movement and the International Sport Federations, which is obviously quite comprehensive. What he didn't cover very well there was how professional sport is organized at the international level. And so that's what I'm going to cover a little bit uh, in today's lecture. And we'll start by reviewing the American model of sport organization and then look at some common models of sport organization outside the U.S. Okay, you know in the American style, if from your other classes that we talked about, that it's a... Um, Mono, there's a monopoly on professional sports from these four sport organizations that you can see here um, on the on the PowerPoint. You've got a commissioner at the top. You've got the owners who uh, manage and own um, their individual teams, and that essentially comprises the league. Um, so they they run obviously in a, in a monopoly style, but they also sort of operate as a cartel. The only way that you can get into those leagues is by buying your way in, um, and um, essentially, once you're bought in, unless you do something really, really dumb, it's hard to get knocked out. Um, and there's a set limit on the number of teams that can be in that. So it is, again, it is, it's sort of a, what we would call a closed system. That closed system of governance gives um, the American model of professional sports several advantages. The first you can see here is they have broad, legitimate control over their sport. Essentially, if the NFL makes a rule, that rule at some point is going to trickle on down uh, to even the youth levels. And you, you can see that with some of the stuff that's happened with concussions. The rules that they make in the NFL work their way on down to youth sport. The second thing that happens is because they're self-contained units, the U.S. government has essentially said, look, we're out. We're not going to do anything. You guys manage your own um, you, you manage your own um, sport organization. We're not going to get involved in um, any of the, the management, p punishment, anything of that nature. So there's very limited government oversight unless it's a significant or really egregious um, action. Uh, the third benefit of this style is that you have a ton of economic power. As you know, the NFL has made over $15 billion last year. The NBA, Major League Baseball, and NHL are all very lucrative leagues. Uh, that have a lot of economic power and they're looking for more and they look for more by going abroad so as this last bullet uh, indicates the NFL is transnational in nature as is the NBA as is Major League Baseball as is hockey they play games abroad they import labor from across the country they sell their jerseys their hats and all of their gear everywhere um, across the world so they're very big powerful organizations and as you can see here they often um, act like national governing bodies or global sport organizations in their own right they don't report to the Olympics. They don't care what the Olympic movement does. The NBA, if they want to send their players, they don't want to send their players, that's fine. Hockey and baseball don't send their players to the Olympics. The NFL could care less about that. So they kind of do their own thing. Basketball and hockey fall a little bit more in line, but even hockey has rejected the notion that they should stop their season for the Olympics, which um, other sports obviously do. Okay, so what you see at then in, in other countries, and so this is very much a non-American model, is, is a, more of a club system. We'll talk about the club system and the county system. When we talk about the club system, the club system is developed regionally around a single sport or in some cases multiple sports. Most of the time you'll see this, you know, like whether it's rugby or, or cricket or, um, or the, the most prominent one being soccer. And a lot of times these clubs are not just singular clubs, but they have n n uh, several teams at numerous age levels. And I'm going to pop up um, Barcelona's website here that you can see that um, obviously Barcelona has ro roller hockey, well, who knew, futsal, handball, basketball, and then obviously they have football or what we call soccer. And they have several teams. They have a first team, they have a B team, they have a U19A, they have a U19B, then they have obviously the youth academy, they even have a women's team. Um, and so this is kind of what we're talking about here at the club level, is that they've got multiple teams at, at various age levels, and, in the, and then at Barcelona they even have multiple sports. Obviously, what Barcelona particularly and most soccer clubs are famous for is their top team that competes at the highest level in their league or that competes uh, in worldwide competitions, which we'll get to in a second. Um, each of those teams obviously can advance to, pl uh, to play other clubs at the national and sometimes the international level, and uh, again, we'll look at that a little bit there at the end. One of the things that's the most unique about this and very distinct from America is that they're also subject to promotion and relegation. Um, promotion is when you move from a lower league to a higher league. Uh, relegation is when you move from a higher league to a lower league. Usually the national governing body of each country or each league is going to set the terms of the standards for promotion and relegation. And that is the number of teams that get to move up or the number of teams that get to move down. And so to kind of give you a better notion of how this works, 
we'll take a look here at um, the English ah, the English football system. Okay, so this is in England. In England, they have four. Well, they have more than this, but these are the top four professional leagues. As you can see here, we got the Premier League, and this is a little bit old. Um, they have the Championship, they have League One, and they have League Two. So the teams here at the bottom of the Premier League, uh, in this case uh, it was Reading, Wigan, and uh, QPR, were at the bottom of the Premier League. Those three teams at the bottom, when they lose, they are going to move over to the Championship. The three teams that will then replace them will be Hull City, Leicester City, and Cardiff City, and they will move into the Premier League. And the same would be true um, in the Championship in League One, League One, and League Two. This changes the, the organization drastically because obviously there's a huge, huge economic incentive to stay in the Premier League, to stay up, as they, as they sort of say. Because obviously... Uh, this league is one of the richest leagues in the world. This is not. This is he has even less money, and this has even less money. So as you move up in league, you're going to be getting more and more revenue. There is uh, honestly, there's about a thirty million dollar a year difference between being in this league, the Premier League, and the Championship. Uh, when teams drop out of the Premier League, the Premier League actually gives them a parachute payment to try to. Um, ease the drop, so to speak, when they go down a league. Um, and when the teams move up, obviously they have more money and they can use that to buy better players. The, the trouble runs into it when you're in uh, the Premier League and you have really expensive contracts and then you drop down and your television revenue goes down. Sometimes your attendance goes down. Um, you're not going to be making as much money. It makes it really, really hard to pay your players. So there's a big economic difference in the fact that there's not guaranteed revenue in these other leagues. And this is a model that would be true um, in rugby. This is a model that would be true in soccer. Um, cricket, not so much. Um, but it is a very, very common model um, in soccer. And I'm, I mean, there may be in some uh, European basketball leagues the same way, uh, but I'm not 100% confident on that. But yes, promotion and relegation is a really key attribute because of the economic uh, impacts that go along with that. So make sure you understand that. Make sure you get that in your notes. Okay, the other type of organization that we'll talk about is county organization. This is seen a little bit more uh, in Ireland, as you can see there in the map. It's also seen in, in, uh, in cricket. Um, and so what happens here is the National Governing Board divides the country up into county associations. So every county has their own team. Uh, the county can have numerous clubs, but the clubs compete for a county championship. So your, your competition is really, really local. If you win your county, then you might move up. As you can see here in Ireland, you might move up to a regional championship. The regional champions then play for the national championship. What the county organization does is really focuses here on the local competition level. And so there's a real emphasis on developing local talent and that if the local talent is good, it will move up and benefit the entire country. And again, like I said, this is done mostly uh, where we would see this in Europe is in, uh, is in cricket um, and then also in Ireland with the Gaelic Athletic Association, which are the native Irish games. Um, in the county or the club organization uh uh, structure, you're going to have one of the other key differences is the nature of competition. So it's this is really, really hard for American sports fans to, uh, to understand, but club teams can compete in multiple competitions simultaneously. So if we take a, a famous soccer club like Chelsea FC, this season they're going to compete, or, or they were competing in four different uh, competitions at the same time. So FIFA was hosting the Club World Championship, which Chelsea was participating in. Chelsea also qualified for the Champions League, which is to play the best teams in Europe. Chelsea also, by nature of being in the Football Association in England, is playing for the Championship of England. At the same time, they're also playing in their regular season championship. So this is makes scheduling really, really tricky for teams uh, in the club or county structure. It also makes it really... Uh, saturated for the sports consumer. So fans have a, have a lot of opportunity to see their teams, but it also drains the team a little bit. So sometimes what you will see at the club level is when you have a Champions League match, Chelsea's going to play their top players. When, Ch when Chelsea plays in the FA Cup, if they're playing a team that's not very good, they won't play their best players. This would be something like having, um, if, we, if we take NC2A basketball, for example, it would be like playing the regular season, the conference tournament, 
and the NC2A tournament and potentially a preseason tournament in Hawaii all at the same time. Usually what it looks like is that league games are played usually on Saturdays. Um, FA Cup games are played during some weeks, and Champions League games usually happen on Tuesdays or Wednesdays. The FIFA World Cup is sort of organized around that. What's interesting about the club structure of playing multiple competitions simultaneously is that the qualifications for, let's say, the Champions League and the Club World Cup are based not on what you're doing this year, but on last year. So you could have a team that does really, really well, and, and you get rid of two of your players. Well, those two players may actually play against the team that they helped get to that level. So the Chelsea te- what Chelsea did in 2018-2019 influences where, che- where, che- where Chelsea will play in 2019 and two- 2020. So that's really what we wanted to cover relative to um, sport organization at the global level. So again, it's different than the American model. You've got um, clubs that are organized regionally. They can have multiple teams. They can play in multiple competitions, and one of the key features is that they can get promoted or relegated in their leagues if they don't do well. Um, In some other countries, they will run a county-type organization where there's a real focus on grassroots and local development. If that local talent does well, they can play at the regional or the national level, and then even sometimes at the international level. And then whether it's county or club, you'll see multiple competitions happening at the same time. So it's not sort of a sequential like, oh, if you win your, if you win your conference, then you go to the NC2A tournament, NC2A tournament, and you advance. You could play a tournament and regular season and another competition all at the same time. Um, so it can be a little bit confusing, but hopefully this lecture uh, will help you understand a little bit why they have so many games going on seemingly uh, in international soccer. Okay, thanks. And if you have any questions, make sure to email me.